So I've kind of considered my talk a, uh, I guess if there were a title, to Because of People Like You, because I want to show you the impact that people like you have had um, in pediatric cancer, although everything I say about pediatric brain cancer, I think really permeates throughout pediatric cancer in general, and as you've already heard, was really the driving force between much of what's happened in adult cancer as well. Now, before I begin, um, there is one kind of admission of guilt that I think uh, is important to start with. And in some ways, when I look back at my career and what we've done over the last 50 years, it's a guilt that actually still bothers me quite a bit. When I began in the medical field, there was, I think, a truism that we never question. And that was in pediatrics, the patients are young, and I think that would be acceptable to most of us. And that because they're eventually going to become adults, cancer in children are just the onset of adult disease early. And under those circumstances, we can think of young patients with cancers as just adult cancer in the young. Well, as I said, I think most of us in the room would agree that children are young, so that part seems still to fit and is true. But unfortunately, the second half of that equation turned out to be completely wrong. For 50 years, we've been treating pediatric brain tumors as if they were the brain tumors of adults. And what about 10, 15 years ago, when we were having virtually no success, we finally said, can we bring the resources of an institution like the Dana-Farber together to begin to see if that very premise itself was wrong? And so with the enormous frustration of not being able to cure most of these families, what we did is we began utilizing the infrastructures that Barrett and others have told you about in terms of let's not think we know the answer, let's go back to first principles and actually try to understand the question. And so what we did is we began sequencing these tumors and we discovered two shocking realities almost instantly. The first is that the mutations that you've heard them talk about, for example, in the adults, frequently do not occur in any of the pediatric tumors. The pediatric tumors seem to have something slightly different in them. And the second component that's related to that is, unlike most adults, where in our adult life we're mostly kind of growing this way, in kids they're actually growing this way. Rapidly dividing cells in a pediatric patient aren't the exception, are not the disease, it's the process of going from a single fertilized egg up to the size of an adult. And it turns out that the majority of pediatric brain tumors and tumors in general are not the same things as adults. Kids haven't been smoking for 30 years or drinking, drinking polluted uh, air, those kinds of things. It turns out that pediatric cancer uses that ability to be allowed to rapidly divide and twist it in a way that benefits the tumor, which means the approaches to pediatric tumors have to be completely unique from anything that we had really been moving forward in adults. And this kind of awakening 10, 15 years ago, when we suddenly realized we had been doing it all wrong, sometimes the most important discovery is not the answer itself, it's recognizing that you shouldn't be going this way, you need to be going this way, because once you do that, the opportunities become enormous. So I wanted to tell you about because of people like you. So when we first came up with this concept of doing this, there were no grants, there were no national agencies. Pediatric cancer compared to adults is relatively rare. There are about a million and a half adults will get diagnosed with cancer this year. There are five to 10,000 kids, so not even on the same order of magnitude. And so there were no large granting agencies to go to. How did we fund all of this research? All of it happened because of people like you. You provided us the resources, the infrastructure that you've already heard about, that allowed us to do the kinds of things that we needed to do to allow these discoveries to go forward. I'm gonna tell you about three examples of how that actually has changed the way we do. Um, the first one is, uh, uh, the name of the child is Allison Chablin. Now normally we wouldn't talk about a specific child, but this is a family that has actually asked that we talk about them. In fact, she was recently highlighted in the New York Times because of her remarkable story. So Allison, when she was diagnosed as a little four-year-old, um, little four-year-old, uh, ponytail, she's, a, uh, she's always wanted to be a gymnast, and you know, when she walks into the office, she kind of walks in as if she's on a balance beam like this, because that's the way little four-year-olds with their ponytails do it. Um, obviously, 
see she was having some problems. She unfortunately was diagnosed with a highly metastatic malignant tumor that under the microscope looks exactly like the same tumor that Ted Kennedy died of, what's called glioblastoma multiforme or malignant glioma. Again, it turned out that although they look the same under the microscope, remember the microscope is 500-year-old technology, so it's not exactly the way we should be thinking about things. When we looked at the molecular analysis, we discovered a mutation in her tumor that had been seen in a type of adult cancer called melanoma, type of skin cancer. And so what we did is we created a national trial where we took the drugs that were being used for the adult cancer and we decided to use them in children. And in this trial that was now opened in both Europe and North America, we looked for the very first patient we would treat, and of course, that became Alison Chablin. Now, imagine being the parent sitting in that room. Your child's got an incurable, metastatic, untreatable tumor. The doctors come to you and say, we would like to give your child a drug, a drug that's never been given to any child whatsoever. We don't know if it's going to make your hands fall off, if it's going to make your you know, heart stop working, all of those things are unknown, but we need to try doing something in all of our data, the data that was funded because of people like you, we believe it has a chance of working. Family said, given the options, we are absolutely willing to do that. So we gave her the drug, it's a pill she takes once a day. Um, two, weeks, uh, two months later, she came back, we did her first MRI scan, and what do you think we saw? All gone all of her tumor in the brain and in the spine was gone. Now, of course, when Allison came in, she was still doing this. Unfortunately, actually, she was doing it much better. Allison's now almost eight years old. She is the first child on the drug, and she is the longest patient on the drug. She's almost been on therapy now for three and a half, going on four years. Obviously, her balancing has got much better. You know, she now likes to do the splits. Obviously, I'm not gonna try that uh, for you, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, to see that child, bound into the room is remarkable, and that happened because of people like you. The second scenario I want to tell you was again a remarkable finding where we had three patients diagnosed, um, three different children diagnosed, and their parents came to us and said, what are you going to do for our children? And we said, well, we're going to give you the standard radiation and chemo that we've been giving everyone for the last 15 years because that's all we know. And they said, how can you not know more? This is the tumor they have is the most common tumor in pediatrics, the most common tumor in the brain. How can you not know anything? And we said, because we don't. And they said, okay, we're gonna generate the funds and we expect you to put the resources of Dana-Farber on this to answer the question, why do our kids have it and how do we treat them? So we started a research project, in fact, created an entire program under the direction of myself and um, a really remarkable scientist, uh, Dr. Chuck Stiles. And from that, we did something that at the time was considered absolutely novel and almost unacceptable. We went out and we liaisoned with a chemist, and what we did is we manufactured every single drug, experimental or otherwise, that actually attacks these pathways. We built them all in our labs, we started testing them, combining them, that kind of stuff. If you try to do this with a pharmaceutical company, when you go into the first company to get the first drug, you have to sign a big stick, uh, stack of papers that says, we won't talk about this to anybody else, we won't trust it with any other drugs, we'll never combine it with anything. Those are the kind of regulatory requirements as each company protects its own. By having used the, the funds that were developed because of people like you, what we did is we synthesized all 30 compounds, we tested them, and I will never forget this. Once we got all the data together, we went to a large multinational pharmaceutical company, and they brought us into their office, and the lady who's you know, the kind of director of people who want their drug, uh, that's not her official title, but that was her <laughs> job, and so she said, well, actually, before you guys came, I looked it up, and it turns out we've never actually signed a confidentiality agreement or an MTA. So, you know, she had papers with her, so we can certainly start that process, but we're not going to be able to tell you anything. And Chuck Stiles, the co-director, he kind of, you know, we looked at each other. There was no physical wink, but the wink was implied. Um, no, actually, we're here to tell you what your drug does, how it works, how it penetrates into the brain, and why we need to do a clinical trial. Two hours later, when we walked out of the room, they had given us the clinical trial to start, which is just beginning across the country, because we now have a drug that they didn't even know hit this target. 
called KIAA-1549, Truncated Fusion BRAF. Or we give it long names, I think my wife says, to, so that we feel more important. Um, <laughs> here's an opportunity where, because of people like you, we developed all of that expertise that's now impacting the lives of kids. And then I just wanted to finish with one last example that unfortunately we still have more to go, which is why, because of people like you, we still have more to do. And that is a disease called diffuse intrinsic pontinglioma. This is the only pediatric tumor in which from the day you are diagnosed, you are terminal to begin with. On average, it affects kids normally between the ages of about six and eight. Um, by eight months, half of the kids have already died of their disease, and by two years, they're pretty well all gone. It is a devastating disease for which there is no known treatment. And because of people like you, we, were, we put the resources together with all of the molecular stuff you've heard so that we brought these kids in, we biopsied their tumor, something that was considered unallowable before we actually did it and showed that it could be done. We discovered eight new mutations that are actually the cause of the disease that occur in different subgroups. So one group has these two, this group has a different group, and the third group a different. And we have just started the first clinical trial of the drugs that target that disease. This is a disease that, as of today, has a median survival of eight months. But because of people like you, we now know the mutations that have caused it. And if you take everything you've heard so far and you can put that together, you can imagine what the next five years are going to look like. We are going to cure that disease in our lifetimes and in the lifetimes of the children that would otherwise have died. And that happened because of people like you. You have a long way to go. This battle is not done. But I'm convinced with, because of people like you, we are going to solve these problems. And I want to just say, uh, you know, from the bottom of my heart, from those of the kids, the impact you've had is astronomical. And we're committed that with your support, we're going to see this battle to the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>